Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Hello, everyone. Thank you for letting us spend some time with you. I am being carefully supervised and monitored this morning. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And, uh... (laughs) Starting out to be a bright, sunshiny, happy Monday here where we're at. It's beautiful. Spring's right around the corner. I know we've still got some cold weather to get through, but that's okay. Everything in its season. That's it. (laughs) Um, If you're new here and you like what you hear, those like buttons and share buttons work really well. If you turn your notifications on, that helps boost everything up in the analytics and says, hey, somebody likes this, maybe you should check it out too. We don't get paid for it, but it just helps other people hear us. If you have the free speaker app, you can leave a comment if you choose um, and do it live while we're still live. We've got a few more months of that. So, um, am I missing? Yeah, I'm missing something. <laughs> don't forget to go to givecut90.com. Check out the books that are there. More on those later. And uh, hopefully... You'll, you might learn something today, maybe. That's my goal. And I don't want anybody to think I'm going to brag about this because that's not my intent. <clears throat> but in a few weeks, we will have produced 600 episodes of this podcast over the last six years. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um <laughs> And, and I thought about that when I when I looked at the numbers. And do you realize that would mean that you would know, need to go to a place of worship once a week for 12 years, tithe your 10%, and get far less information than we put out each week. Now, on top of that, if you go to a Christian church that follows the lectionary, and the lectionary is based on a three-year cycle. It means you would hear basically the same sermon once every three years because you know, the lectionary is based on a three-year cycle. So in 12 years, you would hear the same message preached four times. Now, some 33-plus years ago, I happened to know a... Uh, well, I'm not going to tell you what denomination he was. <laughs> he was a preacher who literally would type out his sermons and read them. And and his excuse, I guess is a good way to say that, was that it kept him from getting distracted. Now, I use notes. Sometimes I follow them. (laughs) And sometimes you go down rabbit trail. And sometimes I go down a (laughs) rabbit trail. Um, But basically, in, in speaking with him, he said, he only needed three years of sermons because he would repeat the same sermon every three years. And he said, nobody noticed. Nobody realized. Now, he was older, getting ready to retire. Nobody in his career realized what he had been doing. If you're sitting under a preacher like that, you might want to think about finding someplace else to go. By the way, his attrition rate was terrible. The people leaving his churches. You know, uh, he, he was one of the more itinerant pastors, I know, because <laughs> they moved him around a lot. Um, <clears throat> some uh, 
synagogues, even Messianic synagogues, use the Torah portions for their service. And they're on a yearly schedule. So, you, you know, you hear basically the same thing every year. Um, for for the people who have been faithfully listening, um, you know, every so often I revisit something, a subject, um, and it includes a lot of the same material, and I cross-reference a lot of the same material. <clears throat> but that's kind of different because I usually try to approach it from a different point of view, a different perspective, and give you deeper insight into some of those things. If you're interested, all of these uh, episodes are, are archived on the Spreaker platform. Um, I think they're all on YouTube as well on my channel. So if you want to go back and listen, you have the ability to do that. Now, here's where I'm going to boast just a little bit. Not much, just a little bit. On top of producing, on the average, two episodes of this podcast every week, I've written three books, Tradition to Truth, God's Universe, God's Rules, and Inheriting Lies. They're all available out there if you want them. Um, and I still put together teachings for Messianic Delaware several times a year. Yeah, that's a lot of work. Um, it is a lot of work to organize those lessons. It's even more work to keep all that straight in my head. <laughs> uh, because sometimes if I'm preparing a lesson for one group and and... I'm doing the podcast. Sometimes things get a little fuzzy and I have to straighten it out, but that's okay. It's what notes are for. <laughs> um, but you wouldn't believe how much you can learn when you need to be able to convey an idea or concept from the Bible and have it applicable in the world we live in today. And that brings me to a point that I want to make here. <clears throat> when you're studying the Bible, Study as though you need to teach it to somebody, to somebody who's not familiar with it, um, somebody who may have read it, but they're not, they don't have a good grasp of what you're going to be saying. Don't be afraid to go down the rabbit trails, okay? Sometimes they take you places unexpected, and you find things that uh, you might not expect and things that might surprise you. Um, I've often said the Bible interprets itself. Um, if you feel the need to venture outside of the Bible to, very, to verify something you think is right, you are probably wrong. Just saying. Um, I've lost track of how many times I have said that the Bible in its original language and context is agonizingly specific. The problem is when we try to use a translation, even a good translation, to figure out what lessons being taught or what message is being delivered, it, it can be confusing. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak to Messianic Delaware last week. Uh, that video is on their teaching page if you go to, I think it's messianicdelaware.org, um, if you want to see it. And I spoke about the danger of using a single verse as the foundation of a theology or a doctrine. And a question came up, which is a good thing. Um, the question came up concerning what some people think is a contradiction. And, you know, in Exodus 33.20, we read, You cannot see my face for no one can see me and live. But previous to that, you, you want to read that couple of verses. It seems to contradict that. <clears throat> then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Be Abihu, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was a work like a pavement made of sapphire, as clear as the sky itself. But God did not lay his hand on the nobles of Israel. They saw him, they ate, and drank. Exodus 24, verses 9 through 11. Uh, wait a second. How is it that the 70 elders, elders along with Aaron, uh, Nadab, and Abihu, 
and Moses were able to see God if later Moses was told, nobody can see my face and live. It, it seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? Well, I'll say it again for the people in the back of the room. The Bible in its original language and context is agonizingly specific. And this is a great example of that. You know, along with a great example of why we can trust the Bible, but we need to verify what's in our translation. Let's look at a bigger picture and see if we can pick up on the difference, even in English. And if you listen carefully, you should be able to recognize what the difference is. There'll be a test at later. Then the Lord said to Moses, come, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of Israel's elders, and you are to worship at a distance. Moses alone shall approach the Lord, but the others must not come near, and the people may not go up with him. When Moses came and told the people all the words and ordinances of the Lord, they all responded with one voice. All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Early the next morning, he got up and built an altar at the base of the mountain, along with twelve pillars for the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent out some young men of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half the blood and put it in bowls, and the other half he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people, who replied, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, we, and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Adab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was a work like pavement made of sapphire, as clear as the sky itself. But God did not lay his hand on the novels of Israel. They saw him, and they ate and drank. Exodus chapter 24, verses 1 through 11. Did you pick up on the difference? You know, even, <clears throat> even in a good English translation, there's a difference between the use of the word Lord in all capital letters, the word God with a capital G, and the word God or gods with a lowercase g. Here we see the word LORD, all capital letters, meaning Yehovah, when the tetragrammatron is used, and the word GOD, where the word Elohim should be found. The problem is, in verse 10 that Meyer just read, we don't see the word Elohim. Not the way we think we should. We see the word Elohi. It's Elohi Yisrael. Now, that particular use should be a clue that something is different, and the way that the verb saw is conjugated in this verse is different also. Now, because of the original language and context, we know they didn't see Yehovah, the Tetragrammaton, the Yudhe Vavhe, but they saw as in they beheld the glory of God. They didn't look at the Creator's face, but as many of the prophets write, they observed the glory of the Lord, all capital letters, the glory of Yehovah. Ezekiel describes this in uh, Ezekiel 11.22, when the cherubim with the wheels beside them spread their wings, and the glory of the God of Israel, same Hebrew verbiage there, Elohi Yisrael, was above them. Same same words. Same words. So what you just heard is not only how the Bible does not contradict itself, but how it interprets itself. Wow. Somebody out there is going, huh? <laughs> you have to be very, very careful when you read. and very Because if you just read over it, it sounds like, well, how can they sit in the presence of God 
when Moses can't? That doesn't make sense, right? Of course it doesn't. The contradictions belong to us, and we have to be willing to figure them out. You know, there, there's no need to venture outside the Bible to find the answers. But in this particular situation, there is a definite need to consider the agonizingly specific original language and context. But there's good news, <laughs> okay? You more than likely have the, the same access to the same free uh, re- resources that I use to uncover a lot of these things, if you're willing to search them out. Some of the stuff I use isn't free. You have to pay for it, but it's worth it. Trust me. Um, now, if you don't have time or you don't know how, well, maybe that's why you listen to us. I don't know. Um, but it's available. There, these resources are out there if you're willing to. To use them. And if you're willing to look at these things and say, that just doesn't make any sense, start digging. These things are out there. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, give you a small excerpt from what I taught last week from Messianic Tower. It comes from Jeremiah. If you want to read the couple of verses from Jeremiah. <clears throat> This is what the Lord says. Take heed for yourselves. Do not carry a load or bring it through the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. You must not carry a load out of your house or do any work on the Sabbath day. But you must keep the Sabbath day holy, just as I commanded your forefathers. Jeremiah 17, verses 21 and 22. Remember that in the original, there were no verse numbers. Okay, these this particular passage um, would be considered one repeated command. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and later the rabbis would look at this, these couple of what we now call verses, and they would come up with some additional regulations. Um, those regulations can be found in the Mishnah, and when you read them, it comes from Shabbat one. It reads like a lawyer wrote some really abstract contract. Um, and, and I'm not going to bore you with that. <laughs> I'm not going to burden you with that. Maybe I should say it that way. <clears throat> um, basically, my paraphrase, it, 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 it tells us that if a poor person is standing outside of a house and reaches inside the house to take something from someone inside the house, brings it outside, even if it was something to eat, they have committed a sin. If someone inside the house has something in their hand, they reach it outside the house, even if it's something to eat, they hand it to a poor person, they have committed a sin. Hmm. Handing someone something or receiving something through a doorway is considered carrying a burden in the Mishnah, and it's looked at as sin. Now, this is really taking the original context of this particular passage away from its original intent and replacing it with our own intent. Not only is it confusing, it's dangerously close to blasphemy. Um, This particular concept has gone so far in in today's world that most Jewish people refuse to lock their door on the Sabbath day because they can't carry a key in their pocket. That's considered carrying a burden out of your house. Now, if we extrapolate that logic, you know, carry it out to its full extent, Think about this. If a pre, you know, a pregnant woman could not go, if she was inside, she couldn't go outside because that's carrying a burden, a child, through the doorway. If she was outside, she couldn't come in. Right? Now, a nursing mother is really in trouble because not only would she be carrying the child in her arms this time, she'd also be carrying food for the child. 
that you know that just goes to show you how ridiculous some of these things can be we try to instill laws on our own that are not found in scripture but they attempt to uh, protect us from sinning if that did I say that right you think so okay but the problem is they're confusing they seem to contradict what's written and the contradictions belong to us now in some but not all Jewish communities the mission is not seen as conflicting or contradicting the Bible but a lot of people want to elevate the Mishnah to the level of Scripture. That is a problem. Not all communities do that, but some do. The Jeremiah passage means what it says, and it matches every other verse about the Sabbath. Don't work on the Sabbath. Make it a special day. Guard it because it's special. I'm not sure you realize the people who give us the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes, they were a very important uh, group of people around the first century. Now, some, but not all of them, were so so zealous, they would stop eating on the fifth day. They would stop drinking on the sixth day because they thought that relieving oneself would be considered work on the Sabbath. Again, context and language is important. Is it really work? Now, think about this. If it's a hot day and you want to take a glass of water outside to enjoy it, you can't because that's carrying a burden from inside the house to outside the house. That doesn't sound like Jeremiah would write that doesn't sound like our creator would say no if you want to drink you have to stay inside do you realize how much freedom there is in observing the sabbath you get to take a day off so why do we make it so much work so complicated to take a day off and you know, I've said this before, I think it's in, in one or two of the books. A young married couple is going to observe the Sabbath different than an older couple, different than a single person. A couple with no children is going to be you know, do things differently than a couple with children. And they all have the freedom to make that day special. You know, if we really think about it, the Mishnah treats the Sabbath um, in such a way that you couldn't even carry a meal to a sick neighbor. I'm I'm positive that's not the intent. (laughs) Okay? You know, compassion, acts of compassion are always allowed on the Sabbath. We're the ones who take it too far. We're the ones that contradict the Bible, not the other way around. There are no contradictions in the Bible if we are willing to look at the original, agonizingly specific language and context. And quite often, if you have a good translation, that's all you need. waiting for uh, a new translation to be delivered and I will speak more on that after I have a chance to go through it uh, we have a what I would call a short copy <laughs> and I was looking through it a while ago and it's actually the three or four passages I looked at aren't bad they're pretty close so we'll see how the rest of it goes as long as the the language is um, dedicated to the original. 
I think it'll be okay. The Bible holds no contradictions. It's that simple. If, if the Bible held any contradictions, it would not be infallible. It would be a work of fiction. It would not be true, which means that there would be no truth in the words of our Creator, and we know better than that. We should know better than that. David writes that your words are true. How then can there be any contradictions? It doesn't contradict itself. It will interpret itself. Sometimes you have to hunt for it. But it's there. And all we have to do is take the time and be willing to dig. So, until Thursday. Until Thursday. We wish you many blessings. Yes, blessings, everyone. And study, read, figure these things out. Take care.